An 18-year-old male professional athlete was admitted to the hospital because of fevers, abdominal pain and hematochesia, which is the presence of fresh blood in the stool. In medicine, this is called the chief complaint, so let us hear the history of these three chief complaints. First, let's agree from now on that every male patient is called XY and every female is XX based on their chromosomes. So, XY is a professional athlete that has visited the hospital for three times in the last three weeks. 20 days ago, XY developed mild pain in his right lower abdomen that was gradual and crampy which comes and goes while he was in a trip for athletic training. He also developed fever that was almost 38 degrees Celsius in addition to mild nausea and loose stools that were in a normal appearance. So, he presented to the emergency department for evaluation, but everything was normal including the examination and the investigation results such as blood tests and stool tests, and also CT scan of his abdomen and pelvis. All of these were normal. Therefore, the patient was discharged with simple analgesia after 5 hours of an uneventful monitoring without receiving a specific diagnosis. During the next 14 days, his pain and fever subsided and the loose stools resolved, but mild nausea persisted and then increased during the next 2 days when things started to complicate. The pain returned to the right lower quadrant of his abdomen. Meanwhile, the patient was constipated and his athletic trainer advised him to take a rectal suppository after which he regained his bowel motions, but this time with a stool, mucus and blood. Then his temperature jumped to 39.7 degrees Celsius, so XY was scared and went back to the emergency department for the second time. In the emergency department, examination revealed tenderness in his right lower abdominal quadrants, including the right flank. Everything else was normal. Review of the systems was negative for anything and there was no family history of medical illnesses such as autoimmune diseases or inflammatory bowel disease, let's say. All of the investigations were normal except for mildly distended fluid-filled small bowel in addition to the air fluid levels in the rectum as detected by MRI. The patient received acetaminophen, ibuprofen and intravenous fluids and was scheduled for an outpatient clinic visit. The internist there found tenderness over the same previous areas without any rebound tenderness, masses or guarding which is an involuntary contraction of abdominal muscles to protect a local area of pain and also he found a tender lymph node on the right groin area. Then he was decided to do a colonoscopy to have a look at his large bowel. As a preparation for colonoscopy, the patient needs to take a bowel preparation regimen consisting of laxatives which made him develop a bowel movement that contained a large volume of blood gushing outside his bowel. The doctors knew something serious was going on. Because of that high fever that was close to 40 degrees Celsius, the pain that became severe and the new bleeding that made his blood pressure drop suddenly. The patient became more tired and examination revealed scant blood in the rectal vault with a tender right inguinal lymph node. Blood and a stool sample were obtained for culture and the CT scan was again normal. The patient was admitted to the hospital. That evening a temperature of 40.2 degrees Celsius developed with associated rigors and the patient appeared to be confused. The blood tests now revealed leukocytosis which is an increase of white blood cells defending the body against bacteria and the blood samples that were taken for culture revealed the growth of gram-negative rods known as Klebsiella pneumonia and gram-positive cocci which suggest a polymicrobial sepsis. The patient was prescribed antibiotics with fluids to cover these microorganisms. One day after admission, the CD scan with contrast material injected revealed extraluminal air fluid collection 20 mm by 10 mm anterior to the spine, between the sigmoid colon and the right common iliac artery, with a adjacent thickening of a short segment of the arterial wall. There was no bowel wall thickening, bowel distension or colonic diverticulosis. The appendix was not visible. Now, we must exclude a list of differential diagnoses as part of the management and let's do this together. The patient is a previously healthy 18-year-old male professional athlete who presented with fever, pain in the right lower quadrant, loose stools and nausea. What are common causes of pain in the right lower quadrant in a previously healthy 18-year-old man? Among patients who present to the emergency department, 
5 to 7 percent have acute abdominal pain. Approximately 50 percent of these patients receive a diagnosis of acute gastroenteritis, a condition that is associated with loose stools and nausea, in addition to the abdominal pain. Another 25 percent of the patients receive a diagnosis of a viral or bacterial infection on the basis of the results of microbiologic testing. The remaining patients need to undergo further testing and imaging studies for a diagnosis to be established. Is it appendicitis? In considering a diagnosis of appendicitis in this patient, the patient did not develop epigastric pain preceding the right lower quadrant pain, neither did the patient develop rebound tenderness nor loss of appetite before the onset of his symptoms, and the appendix was not seen during the imaging studies, which means it's not enlarged and not inflamed, whereby it should appear thickened and swollen on ultrasonography. Is it diverticulitis? It would be helpful to know the ethnic background of the patient because Asian patients most commonly have diverticulitis on the right side in the cecum or ascending colon whereas North American and European patients most commonly have diverticulitis on the left side in the sigmoid colon and present with this condition at an older age. However, this patient imaging studies do not show evidence of a diverticulum in the colon or fat stranding and such a finding would be expected in a patient with an inflammatory process adjacent to the colon, including diverticulitis. Is it inflammatory bowel disease? As revealed from the patient's history, the patient did not have a family history of inflammatory bowel disease. This disease is 3 to 20 times as likely to develop in first degree relatives of patients with Crohn's disease as in the general population. A new diagnosis of Crohn's disease is certainly a possible explanation of this patient's presentation given the rectal bleeding, pain in the right lower quadrant, nausea and loose stools. However, the imaging studies do not show transmural thickening or inflammation of the bowel, skip lesions, creeping fat or other hallmarks of Crohn's disease such as a fistulous tract. Clinically significant abnormalities on CT are detected in 47% of patients in the emergency department who have Crohn's disease. A diagnosis of ulcerative colitis is also possible, given the rectal bleeding and mucus discharge. However, the ulcerations associated with ulcerative colitis are mucosal and are very unlikely to give rise to a bowel perforation unless toxic megacolon develops. Is it infectious colitis? Infectious colitis that is due to organisms such as Salmonella enterica, Campylobacter jejuni, and Yersinia enterocolitica should be considered in this case, but stool samples have not revealed them. The patient had been traveling and presumably eating out for most of his meals, which would put him at risk for an infection. Yersinia enterocolitica is a particularly important consideration in this case, since this organism can cause pain in the right lower quadrant and mesenteric lymphadenopathy. This patient had an enlarged right inguinal lymph node, but no other signs of colitis on CT, and this diarrhea subsided spontaneously. Is it colitis associated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs? Colitis that is associated with the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs should be in the differential diagnosis in this case, given the history of ibuprofen use. However, the amount of ibuprofen given was never significant to cause this disease entity. Is it Meckel's diverticulum? Meckel's diverticulum with perforation is a compelling diagnosis in this case, given this patient's young age. However, Meckel's diverticulum with perforation usually occurs in early childhood. In addition, the imaging studies do not show evidence of this specific small bowel condition except for the dilated loops of small bowel on MRI of the abdomen at the second hospital, a finding that suggests partial small bowel obstruction or ileus. Is it ischemic colitis? Ischemic bowel disease is a rare and serious condition that causes lower gastrointestinal bleeding and has been described in marathon runners. In athletes, reversible ischemic bowel disease involving the cecum and ascending colon with associated pain on the right side may be due to physiological shunting caused by supplantic vasoconstriction or to intravascular volume depletion. Is it sigmoid or rectal valvulus? Valvulus, which is a twist in the large bowel, accounts for 10 to 15 percent of cases of large bowel obstruction. Sigmoid valvulus is more common than cecal valvulus. This patient's imaging studies do not show evidence of a twist in the bowel, however. Is it colon cancer? Colon cancer in the ascending colon or cecum with perforation should be in the differential diagnosis in this case, even though the patient is only 18 years old. Given the rising incidence of colon cancer among young people, this diagnosis must be ruled out. 
Although these patients' imaging studies do not show a mass lesion or evidence of a perforating cancer, the use of CD colonography or colonoscopy will provide a more accurate assessment for a mass lesion in the colon. Is it a right inguinal hernia? The risks of an inguinal hernia with intermittent incarceration, which can lead to ischemic bowel, may be increased in athletes. However, these patients' imaging studies do not show evidence of a hernia and a targeted physical examination and ultrasonography of the groin were not conclusive in any way. Is it foreign body? Well, perforation of the large bowel by a foreign body is the most likely diagnosis in this case, given the slow tempo of the disease course, imaging findings, and the baffling clinical picture. Since the history doesn't provide any clues about what might have pierced the bowel to cause a perforation, I would ask the patient to describe what he had eaten before the onset of abdominal pain. I would specifically ask whether he had eaten any fish with bones, chicken wings or other bone in chicken parts, shellfish such as crabs, lobsters or mussels, or sandwiches held together with toothpicks such as a turkey club. The diagnosis of perforation by a foreign body makes the most sense in this case because it's the only cause of bowel perforation that is associated with both the absence of imaging findings and the absence of an inflamed appearing bowel at the site where the perforation has occurred. Two weeks after the initial episode of pain occurred in this young athlete, he had a repeat episode that was accompanied by back pain. In retrospect, this new pain was most likely associated with the development of an abscess which could explain the findings on the CT scan obtained in the emergency department of this hospital. It is likely that the contained extraluminal air fluid collection adjacent to the sigmoid colon is located at the site of perforation and is the cause of polymicrobial sepsis. However, the patient probably also had an arterioenteric fistula between the sigmoid colon and the right common iliac artery that was caused by penetration of the vessel by a foreign body. On the CT scan, the right common iliac artery has a distinctly abnormal appearing vessel wall. These complications of perforation by a foreign body, which are an abscess and a fistulous connection to the right common iliac artery with resulting hemorrhage into the bowel and polymicrobial sepsis, would explain all the symptoms and signs in this young man. Patients with perforation by a foreign body are usually unable to remember ingesting the foreign body. Most ingested foreign bodies pass without consequence, but 10 to 20% need to be removed endoscopically and 1% surgically. On the basis of the initial interpretation of the CT scan, a colonoscopy was performed. The colonoscopy revealed a large amount of fresh blood in the sigmoid colon, which was lavaged. A 5cm wooden toothpick was found lodged in the proximal sigmoid colon that it had eroded the colon wall on one end. Endoscopic removal of the toothpick led to immediate pulsatile bleeding, which was first addressed with placement of 9 hemostatic clips and administration of a total of 10 ml of epinephrine. Despite these measures, ongoing bleeding was noted at the end of the procedure and emergency surgical consultation was obtained. Toothpick ingestion is associated with a particularly high risk of complications. 79% of cases lead to perforation and 10% to death. Because of the life-threatening bleeding, the Interventional Radiology Service performed angiography which revealed extravasation of contrast material from the right common iliac artery into the sigmoid colon. On exploration of the abdomen, an arterioenteric connection between the sigmoid colon and the right common iliac artery was found, then exploratory laparotomy with repair of the injury of the right common iliac artery with venous graft was performed. On follow-up, the patient did well after surgery and was discharged on the 10th hospital day, six days after the second surgery. At the direction of the team's internist, additional follow-up was arranged with the physical therapy vascular surgery, general surgery and infectious disease services, and the rehabilitation program with the goal of restoring his elite athlete status. So, the final diagnosis here is perforation of the sigmoid colon by a foreign body, which is toothpick, that caused a fistula to the right common iliac artery. So please be careful when eating large amounts of meat to avoid ingesting foreign bodies. Thank you for watching and see you the next video.